Hey everyone, and welcome to the second episode of Starward, where we explore the latest developments in space exploration and technology each and every week. In this episode, we have a lot of exciting news to go through, including the end of the Artemis 1 mission with Orion successfully splashing down in the Pacific Ocean, methane-powered Terran 1 and Zhu Che 2 both being raised vertical, Ingenuity undertaking multiple flights, and much, much more. My name is Jeb, and I'll be your host for this episode of Starward. On Monday, December 5th, Orion performed yet another beautiful flyby of the moon on its way back to Earth. It featured a powered flyby burn in which the spacecraft harnessed the moon's gravity to accelerate back towards Earth. The spacecraft has been regularly treating us to amazing images and videos of our own natural satellite since the launch in mid-November, and we are all delighted to hear from Orion Deputy Progress Manager Debbie Korth that Orion has no major issues and that they could not be more pleased. Just under a week later, on Sunday, December 11th, at around 10.40 a.m. Central Time, Orion splashed down in the Pacific Ocean, marking the end of the Artemis 1 mission. Splashdown. From Tranquility Base to Taurus Litro to the tranquil waters of the Pacific, the latest chapter of NASA's journey to the moon comes to a close. Orion, back on Earth. When it re-entered, it is projected that Orion experienced temperatures of more than 2,800 degrees Celsius, or 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, at a speed of almost 20,000 miles per hour, or 32,000 kilometers an hour. In order to cut down on heating experience during re-entry and reduce g-forces, Orion performed a so-called skip re-entry. This involved coming into the atmosphere at a shallow angle, allowing the spacecraft to bounce back out of the atmosphere. The reduced velocity resulting from this maneuver then allowed the Orion capsule to enter Earth's atmosphere at a safer speed, and with greater precision, enabling re-entry at the same landing area regardless of when and where it came back from the moon, according to NASA. After accounting for ammonia venting and boil-off, six hours and 17 minutes after splashdown, the Orion capsule was recovered by the USS Portland, marking the end of Orion's 25 and a half day journey around the moon. As the Artemis 1 mission comes to an end, we are all left looking forward to the next flight of SLS with Artemis 2, which is unfortunately set to occur no earlier than 2024. However, NASA is setting plans into action to make production of the rocket much more efficient and streamlined. NASA has announced that it is enabling Boeing, the lead contractor for the core stage of the SLS, to conduct final assembly and outfitting of the core stage at Kennedy Space Center, instead of solely at the Michaud Assembly Facility in New Orleans. While the top four-fifths of the core stage will still be assembled at Michaud, the engine section will be assembled and mated at Kennedy. But why is NASA making this change? Well, as the Artemis program ramps up, Michaud engineers will now be able to focus on the manufacturing of the Exploration Upper Stage, or EUS, that will start flying on Artemis 4. In March, NASA announced plans for choosing a second crewed lunar lander called the Sustainable Lunar Developments Program. The lander, to be chosen in early 2023, will be flying one demonstration mission no earlier than Artemis 5. It is worth noting that SpaceX was unable to bid for this contract because they are already going to use their Starship human landing system on the early crewed Artemis missions. According to NASA, this effort is meant to maximize their support for competition and provide redundancy in services to help ensure NASA's ability to transport astronauts to the lunar surface. The contract deadline line was on Tuesday, December 6th, so let's take a look at a few of the bidders and what they have planned. First off, the Blue Origin-led national team has come back with a twist. Just like last time, Blue Origin has teamed with Lockheed Martin and Draper, but this time Boeing, Astrobotic, and Honeybee are joining them. Meanwhile, Northrop Grumman has left the team to work with Dynetics on their Alpaca lunar lander. The first part of NASA's Viper Moon Rover has been delivered to NASA's Johnson Space Center where it will be assembled. It will be the first resource mapping mission to another celestial body, and NASA is planning to land the rover on the moon in late 2024. The part in question is the Near Infrared Volatile Spectrometer Subsystem, one of many scientific instruments that will be on board which will assist Viper in exploring the moon's south pole to get an accurate view of the water ice concentrations. According to a tweet by NASA's JPL, Ingenuity successfully flew on the Red Planet for the 35th time on December 3rd. Flight logs indicate that the mighty little helicopter flew a distance of 49 feet horizontally and set a new maximum altitude record, hitting 46 feet or 14 meters above the Martian surface, 7 feet higher than its previous record. The goal of this flight was to reposition Ingenuity to make sure it stays in touch with the Perseverance rover, which is the only way communications from Earth can reach the helicopter. Interestingly, JPL have not yet confirmed whether Ingenuity took flight again on December 10th. However, this sequence of images was uploaded to the internet by JPL, which seems to suggest that the 110-meter horizontal flight did indeed take place. 
This week sure was a busy one for China. Kicking off the week, Xspace, a Chinese state-owned rocket company, launched the Kuaizhou 11 rocket at 8.15am local time on December 6th. This vehicle, capable of launching up to one metric ton to sun-synchronous orbit, reached orbit for its first time after an unsuccessful launch in July of 2020 and a launch pad explosion last October. Thankfully, this launch went better, with the VHF Data Exchange System, or VDES, test satellite successfully achieving its planned orbit. The VDES is a low-Earth orbit satellite constellation designed by China for maritime tracking. This makes the Kuaizhou 11 the second largest solid-fueled rocket built by China, and it held the title for a grand total of three days. Just three days later, on December 9th, yet another Chinese rocket made it to orbit for the first time, becoming the largest and most powerful solid rocket ever launched by China. The Smart Dragon 3, built by the China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology, lifted off for the first time at 2.30pm local time from the Taiyue Barge located in the Yellow Sea, carrying a payload of 14 satellites, including 8 Jilin remote sensing satellites. Capable of carrying 1.5 tons to sun-synchronous orbit, Smart Dragon 3 could bring launch prices down to $10,000 per kilogram to orbit, and 20 rockets are planned to be produced per year. On the same day, a Long March 2D lit up the sky above the Taiyuan Satellite Launch Center at 2.31 am local time, marking the 71st launch of this rocket and the 453rd launch of the entire Long March rocket family. This launch carried the Gaofen 501A satellite into a sun-synchronous orbit 705 kilometers above the Earth. This hyperspectral satellite, an important part of China's Gaofen project, aims to better observe areas such as atmospheric composition, climate change, air pollution, natural resources, and more. On December 6th, Relativity Space rolled out their Terran 1 at Launch Complex 16. It went vertical at LC-16 one day later and is now awaiting final tests and a launch license from the FAA. Terran-1 is Relativity Space's first orbital-class rocket, which has been in development for over five years. This launcher brings many new innovations to the space industry, such as being 3D printed and also one of the first liquid methane-powered rockets. Launch Complex 16 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station was previously used to launch Titan missiles and eventually used to static-fire Apollo service modules. The last launch from this pad was in 1988, meaning Terran will be the first rocket to launch from LC-16 in 34 years. Meanwhile, over in China, Landspace's methane-powered Zhuche-2 rocket is now planned to launch on the 14th of December, and images from Harry Stranger show that it is currently vertical at Site-96 of the Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center. As the launch of the two methane-fueled rockets draw nearer, the winner of this race still remains uncertain. On December 9th, Yusaku Maizawa, a Japanese entrepreneur, announced the nine crew members scheduled to fly with him around the moon aboard Starship. This will be Maizawa's second private trip to space, and the first one for all the other crew members. Last year, Maizawa visited the International Space Station as one of two space tourists traveling on a Soyuz rocket. The Dear Moon crew consists of eight accomplished artists from a range of disciplines. It includes Tim Dodd. I'm going to the moon. Literally. I'm going to go to the moon. I, st I genuinely still can't believe it. As well as two photographers, a documentary filmmaker, a DJ, and others. This will likely be up there as one of the most documented launches in history. As a bit of a background regarding the Dear Moon mission, in February of 2017, SpaceX announced a plan to fly two private citizens around the moon using a Crew Dragon capsule launched atop a Falcon Heavy rocket. Unfortunately, Falcon Heavy was never certified for human spaceflight, so the project shifted to their upcoming Starship rocket, then called BFR. In 2018, Maizawa purchased the ride and announced his vision to send a crew of creative individuals to the moon with Dear Moon as a way to inspire new generations. In early 2021, Dear Moon made a public call for applications which saw over 1 million submissions from all over the world. The launch is currently planned to take place in 2023, and although this will likely change in the future due to Starship still being in development, we wish all crew members good luck on their journey. On December 8th, Falcon 9 set off into the skies for the inaugural OneWeb mission, carrying 40 satellites to contribute to the OneWeb high-speed internet constellation. Up until February of this year, OneWeb launched their satellites aboard Russia's Soyuz rockets. But due to current events, the company has switched their launch providers to SpaceX and New Space India, the commercial arm of ISRO. This launch was notably an RTLS, or Return to Launch Site mission, meaning the first stage booster performed a boost back burn to propel itself back to Cape Canaveral and touch down on landing zone 1, marking the 154th recovery of an orbital class rocket booster. About an hour after liftoff, the first 14 OneWeb satellites separated from the second stage. Sadly, there was no coverage for the next deployments, and so OneWeb confirmed via Twitter that the deployment was successful. 
In the early hours of December 11th, Falcon 9 launched the iSpace Hakuto R lander from SLC 40 at Cape Canaveral on a mission to the surface of the Moon, as well as NASA's Lunar Flashlight CubeSat on a technology demonstration to observe water ice in the dark lunar craters. This is the second lunar lander that Falcon 9 has launched, and the first commercial lunar lander to ever be launched. After stage separation, the timing of this launch enabled us to witness the impressive boost backburn performed by the first stage as it returned to the launch site and landed on landing zone 2. Always an awesome sight to see. As Hakuto R does not have the necessary propellant to land on the moon through a direct trajectory as was done in the Apollo program, the Falcon 9 had to inject the payload into a high energy orbit. This way, the lander would reach the moon in a few months instead of a few days. Hakuto R is carrying both the Rashid rover of the Emirates lunar mission as well as JAX's lunar excursion vehicle. Landing is expected to occur in April 2023 and will be targeting the Atlas crater. And that's it for this episode of Starward, brought to you by Lab Padre. Make sure to leave a like and share this video if you enjoyed it, and please let us know how we did by leaving a comment down below. Your feedback is greatly appreciated. If you'd like to support what we do, consider supporting us on YouTube or Patreon. And if you haven't already, make sure to check out our latest Starbase Weekly update posted earlier this week. Thank you for joining us, and I'll see you again next week on the next episode of Starward.